I'm sorry, everyone. We have seriously barking dogs right now. It will end in a moment. Testing, so testing, testing. Yeah, we're going out. You're going out on that mic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making, well, making sure that my recording is going out on that mic. Oh, I need to start my recording. This is I have a, six. I have a brand new computer. So you do. What did you get? Two sixty-five. I got a Lenovo i7 gaming machine. They're, cool. They have a big sale on them. They've got a 3060 card in them. Uh, i7 processor. So it's fast. It's cheap. It's and, gorgeous. Mm, not, not really. It's just, it was like fast, cheap on sale. And it's been eight years since I've bought a new PC. Oh, and, yeah. You need and it was, I was starting to crunch on doing like... I have to, if I do interviews, I got to record them locally. I've got to sometimes yeah. stream out at the same time and I got to record on, you know, record multiple streams and stuff. So it's time for, yeah, it's time for new gear. <clears throat> Almost smell of my coffee. All right. But I'm so, not, I didn't spend very much money. They're about, they're about 11, it was about 1300 bucks. So for a, for a new fast ish computer is feels not too bad. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. For reasons I can't identify, we're not going out to Twitch, but I'm not going to try and fix that if we're going out to YouTube. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, you're the, you're the Twitch nerd. I am, and I just have no idea why we're not going out to Twitch, but okay, that's fine. It's, Was it it's important to you? That's yeah. why. <laughs> did you did was it a thing that you wanted to have happen it there, was there's a problem yeah and the server that's, said look, no yeah that's why it didn't work yeah no yeah. twitch for you yeah none yeah yeah computers are stupid yeah i, I mean again like do, do you see the lack of motion I, I bought a new computer it's fine yeah it's faster it does the it it will fulfill on the required jobs that i have for it now monitors, I can get super excited about new monitors. Mm, no, I'm not, I can't. Just like, like I, I've got actually. So I did invest in a really nice monitor last time. I've got a Dell. I've got the big Dell monitor. They're sort of top of the line machine. It was about a thousand dollar monitor, and it's nice. I need to ask um, my husband why there are strange men in our yard. One moment, please. He's, why would he know? Well, he's upstairs and I'm in the basement watching the strange men walk around. I feel like the troll under the bridge down here. Yeah, you're tra well. You're trapped. Like at a certain point, you're trapped. You're you're stuck, um, tied to the stream. This is this is why we go on hiatus for this exact reason that that there's like a certain number of hours every day when you're just you're locked into the room looking for high speed internet, and and you just can't deal with mysterious people wandering around on your property. I, I used not. Go ahead. Oh, I was. I was just going to say that I, according to Grammarly, I use ninety-seven percent more unique words than other users. That's I used forty-six hundred you... unique words last week. That's because you use science words. It's and true. Most people yeah. don't. Yeah. My hair has decided that it wanted to visit the eighties today. I don't know what happened, but I definitely have. So there's a story. Can I tell the story of how I ended up as a blonde? Because I never meant to be a blonde. Sure. Are you blonde? Yeah. Open up the window. Mm, okay. Yeah. I see it yeah. now. Yeah. So I bleached my hair in preparation to dye it the gazillion colors it normally is. And my husband and and I ran out of time, so we were going to do the colors the next day. Bleach one, sa bleach on Saturday, colors on Sunday. And my husband was like, "I really like your hair," so I said, "Okay, I'm not streaming for two more weeks. I will keep my hair this color for two weeks." It sounds like and, a you problem, but anyway. <laughs> and and then and then I pinched a nerve in my shoulder, and I 
I don't have it in me to dye my hair, so I have to have somebody else do it. And the somebody else, tiny intern, hasn't had time to dye my hair. So we are really hoping that either this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon, this, this light colored thing I do not understand will go back to all the colors of the rainbow. Zap Van Zap Van says that hydrogen peroxide is meant for rocket fuel. Yeah, you're, I know. you're stealing the rocket fuel. Yeah, and I'm not getting to drink it either. Because some rocket fuel you just want to drink. <laughs> oh, alcohol. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, let me know when you're, uh, when you're ready. Okay, I'm just lining up the slides. So if I want to show things on the screen, I can. Yeah, like you think that I'm going to direct this conversation in the path where you have slides prepared? <laughs> I, I so so oh. I I got help today pulling slides together, and I told Eric Mattis, our rocket human for Daily Space, who I got help from, find any pictures related to rocket history that may seem useful, and please 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 add them to the slide deck, and I'm hoping that between what I found and what he found, we have the smallest of possibilities of guessing what is mm. in your mind. For those who yeah. don't know, every episode of Astronomy Cast is an oral exam, and I never know <laughs> if I studied correctly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's time to run the gauntlet again. I Tell me when you're ready. Just lining you up in the slides. Do we want to show people the pretty intro for our show? Didn't you already? No, I just showed them a slide. Why? I'm missing a light. No, I think we should move on to the recording part. Okay. I'm They'll guessing... kill us if we don't. You keep okay. moving left. Why are you... I'm okay, not. I I'm fixed not... you. No, okay. you moved. All right. Mm -mm. Okay. I am pressing record on the video. I am I'm pressing... recording on my audio. I'm about to be recording on my audio. It looks like it's recording. I'm letting other people know I'm recording. All right. I'm here. You are here. We shall do this together. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 655. 65 years of space and the Sputnik 1 anniversary. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. It is starting to be fall. We, we have experienced the equinox. RA has reset to its zero point. Life is good. Unless you are the space launch system. Oh, I, you know, you know, that is my... Gen X, constantly pessimistic joy of the week because it's just sort of like, just sit back, eat popcorn, and watch it dance. It's going back and forth and back it's, and forth. It's going back. Going to launch, not going to launch. Yeah. I don't feel any of that. I feel just the anxiety of the tens of thousands of people who worked on this and they really needed to launch to restore their honor. I, uh, I feel for them and I want this thing to fly. I don't, I don't want it to fly very often. I don't want it to fly beyond the number of times they've built this, but, I, but it's already <laughs> built and now I want it to fly. Yes, it deserves I, to launch, but I can enjoy yeah. the dance. Speaking of space flight, it's been about 65 years since the Soviets launched the first orbital satellite into low Earth orbit, Sputnik 1. Now there are thousands of satellites in orbit with tens of thousands on the way. Let's look at the impact that Sputnik had on the history of spaceflight. And we'll talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And I'm going to drink my coffee. Thank you. And we're back. All right, Pamela, happy 65th Sputnik anniversary. What's the exact date for the Sputnik one? Why don't I have that open? One moment, please. 
I feel like that was the easy one. That was the easy question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot to open. So, so there was much running around trying to figure out where the heck in the house I had left my glasses. So instead but what's of. Worse? Yes. 1957. October, there are still weird humans in our driveway. All right. My husband knows it's now his problem. Yep. We have big dogs, one of whom bites. <sighs> October 4th. Do you just want to start the segment over? Sure. There go the dogs. The dogs have noticed the weird guys in the driveway. <laughs> Only one of them cares, though. One of them cares very... Why did that monitor just go out? Okay, that was fascinating. There is a dude right outside my window staring at the side of my house. Okay. And now walking up onto my front patio. Stella is now hiding underneath my chair. You talking to your husband? Yeah, he's not responding. So hopefully he's with them figuring out what the heck is going on. I have no idea what's going on. It's very disconcerting to see what looks like a construction crew of humans in our driveway. Like, I'm used to the termite dude randomly showing up. This, this is like levels above the termite dude, so I'm very confused. Okay, we should record an episode, though. So I'm going to pretend that I know everything and there are not strange humans in my yard and patio. Okay. All right. All right. So first question then, what is the actual exact date of the anniversary? October 4th, 1957. We are at 65 years and it's kind of glorious because that means three generations of people have got to benefit from space flight. 14 years before I was born. More like 16 for you-ish. Yeah, I'm the baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it, so I mean, really, our lifetimes have been space flight. There's now, been space flight happening for our entire lives. Now, it, the story of Sputnik is a really cool one because the the Soviets were trying to say, look, America, we beat you. So as part of getting their satellite into space, and, and both the leader of the US, Eisenhower, and the then leader, it's a yard crew. There's a yard crew in our yard. They aren't supposed to be here till Thursday. Today is not Thursday. All right, we're gonna try and continue this and hopefully they will be on the other side of the yard. If they are right outside of the window, I'm going to murder somebody. <sighs> All right, I'm really sorry, Allie. I'm really sorry. Okay. What what was really cool about this is the leaders of the two countries were really trying to both one up themselves. And first the Soviet leader and then Eisenhower here in the US said that in the geophysical year of science, we are going to launch something into space. And and the Soviets got there first and they really wanted to make a splash with what they were doing. So Sputnik, which is just like 20 something inches wide and with these couple of feet long antennae, it, it launched and it wasn't just a spot in the sky with its highly polished outer shell. It was also transmitting at 20 and 40 megahertz, which are frequencies that, well, any radio, ham radio operator can listen to and so as it went around the planet every 0.3 seconds either a 20 hertz signal came or a 40 hertz signal came they were alternating the two so that they could actually study our ionosphere and other aspects of our atmosphere and anyone could just go outside look up see this state strange new traveler mm. and and the name sputnik actually means travel together and they could use a ham radio to listen. And back then, ham radios were much more common than they are today because you could do no more internet. things. <laughs> right, no internet, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. 
it's just kind of amazing. So, so like the purpose of Sputnik literally was to just go beep yeah. in those in those radio spectra. Yes, to go beep over and over and over in those radio spectra. And it actually caused an entire generation of children here in the U.S. to say, all right, I'm going to do something that no one else has ever done before. I'm going to figure out how to make a rocket rocket. And I think the most famous group of humans to ever do this is, is a group that was called the Rocket Boys. And, and this, this is like where we start talking about, uh, he always went by Sonny, Sonny Hickman, Hickam, uh, Quentin Wilson, Jimmy O'Dell, Carol. Homer Hickam. Homer Hickam. But he, he actually in real life goes by Sonny because mm, he's, okay. he's okay. the second in his family. So right. Homer Hickam Jr., in, in reality, people just call him Sonny. And so there's this whole group of kids. It started with just four, the four you see in the movie, October Skies. But the next year, there were six of them. And, and what I really love is they had the Big Creek Missile Agency was what they called their collection of people that were working to build rockets and go to the science fair. Sputnik Did you know some... that, that Rocket Boys is an anagram for October Sky? No, no, I did not. Yeah, if that... you scramble, I don't know if anagram is the right word, but if you scramble the letters between October, October Sky and Rocket Boys, it's the same letters. I learned something. I am one of the 10,000. There you go. That... Um, so, so when were they, when were the, when were the, were they building their rockets? They, they were doing it right there in, in the 1950s, right after it was one of these, see the launch in October, work on science fair project for the school year, work on science fair project for the next school year, get accused of triggering fires. They didn't actually trigger. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and so they were doing this as teenagers in high school. And Sonny Hickman went on to, I mean, he's a veteran of, of Vietnam. He had a career before going to NASA, but he finally managed to get a job at Marshall Space Flight Center in 1981 as an aerospace engineer. And he was the person who trained the first Japanese astronauts to ever go into space. He assisted with the neutral buoyancy tank that anyone who's ever been to space camp has gone to see. And, and eventually he got to train the astronaut crews for everything from space lab to repairing the Hubble Space Telescope um, and repairing Solar Max. He, he was one of those people that just saw how to make things work and also had the soft skills of knowing how to teach other people to make things work. And then he wrote a whole bunch of books. Go find them. Right, right. All right, we're going to talk about this more, but it's time for another break. All right, I'm going to drink my coffee. We've had complaints of me having dry mouth noises. That's why I'm doing this to you. And you, under, you being under caffeinated. Yeah, which is this, the, the greatest disaster. It, it really, really is. All right, let's continue on. All right. And we're back. So Homer Hickman and his crew, what were some of the other ways that Sputnik inspired the modern space exploration race? Space race. Space race is is clearly the right word. And and when Sputnik took off, uh, the U.S. didn't think we were going to be beat. And, and so this led to an acceleration of transforming missiles into rockets. And and this was actually something that Warner von Braun had really been looking forward to. And so for, for the crew down at Marshall Space Flight Center, that Sputnik launch was a chance to say, hi, please give us all the money we actually need <laughs> to get a spacecraft into the space. And we did it. And, and this started the constant one-upmanship between the two nations where, where 
Russia was the first to get into space. Russia was the first to do a whole lot of things. They weren't the first at Mars. Mars likes to defeat them. Um, right. But they were, but like after Sputnik, the Americans launched theirs. What was it? Explorer one was yeah. the first American satellite. Yeah. But then, but then the Soviets put a human into orbit. Yeah. Which with Yuri Gagarin, and that was a surprise. And then they had the first yes. woman in orbit. They had the did they do the first space? Like a ton of things. Yeah. One after the other, demonstrating that they were masters of spaceflight, relatively speaking. And then the Soviets as part of their space race, helped other nations like China start to get involved. And we here in the U.S. have helped other nations partnering with the European Space Agency, partnering with the Indian Space Agency, now the Italian Space Agency on the DART mission. And, and so we're, what we've been seeing is this competition between groups of nations to do amazing scientific exploration. And the recognition that we may have started with a single tiny satellite I could have picked up and walked away with to now working on heavy lift rockets aimed at creating a permanent presence on the moon the way we have a permanent presence in low earth orbit. The potentially a fully reusable two-stage rocket. What, what's amazing is you go back and you look at the pictures of the rockets envisioned by Werner von Braun, like when yeah. he had his Mars project book where he was yeah. imagining humans flying to Mars and you look at the rocket, it looks exactly the same as the Starship. The yes. stainless steel, the same general shape of the rocket itself, the, the Everything is yeah. almost identical. It's it's kind of amazing how how much and and I think you know when you think about it, like they had figured out the basic laws of physics. Yeah, yeah. Back in the twenties, even with with Goddard and 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 the the first round of people thinking about about spaceflight, even the Chinese a thousand years ago had figured out yes. the basic physics of of this process. Yes. And it was a matter of us not necessarily having the technology, the automation, the experience to make the reality live up to the dream. But, but, but we knew what a rocket should look like. We knew how much energy was required to carry X amount of mass into space, et cetera. Yeah. It's, it, it's astonishing to me. I, th I think I've mentioned this in previous shows that if you go back, every cool idea that you can think of right now, there is a paper from from the 1960s from NASA that describes it. It's, it has already been thought of, everything. Yeah. Uh, moon bases, moon rovers, Mars missions, Mars landers, um, uh, inflatable habitats, uh, make artificial magnetospheres, everything has been, was already thought of back in the 1960s. It's just they couldn't carry, they couldn't make them happen yet. The, the, Nuclear the, rockets, ion <laughs> engines, everything. <laughs> the, the way I often think of it, is as Leonardo da Vinci was to so many decades, centuries of in inventions where he could draw the things that were yet to come, including helicopters. Werner von Braun and the people that worked with him had that same futuristic creativity to see what needs to happen in a time when they couldn't actually make it happen. And while it was a long time to go from Leonardo da Vinci's helicopter drawings to actually having helicopters, with Warner von Braun, it's two generations, three generations. Yeah. Also, Werner von Braun was a Nazi. Just, well, just, yeah. listen, just so people just like people are always like, yeah, but he was a Nazi. Yeah, he was a Nazi. Yes, he was a Nazi. He he was part of the paperclip project of people that were. Um, Basically, the Soviets and the Americans split up the scientists that had been working to develop the V-1 and other rockets in Germany. And uh, with the paperclip project in the U.S., they brought them here and basically gave them forgiveness for whatever else they had been responsible for in exchange for building rockets and putting America yeah. in space. So some of the chat is saying, but he was our Nazi. Yeah, he was just, 
he was he was bought and paid for and he was forgiven and could then build rockets and and carry the americans forward into the modern age of space flight anyway yeah. just you know just so people like people i don't know the people always say like they always like as if we forget that like no like he totally was a nazi anyway um you know what we're gonna talk about some more but it's time for another break all right more coffee so, so you drink your coffee yeah coffee 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 and i have to point out my glorious coffee cup of space, space is by Surly coffee. Amy. Uh, so if you go to uh, Surly Ceramics, there is a link from her necklace page. I'm not wearing one of her necklaces. Um, there's a link from her necklaces page over to her ceramic arts page. I think it's called Retro Arts. Um, I love my coffee mug. All right. She, she doesn't sponsor the show, but... We're going to promote her apparently right now. All right, Fraser, take us to the next segment. And we're back. All right. So I think, I mean, I think the biggest ripple implication of the first satellite launch was it leading to humans going to the moon. Yeah. The Apollo program. Yeah. And that was very much part of that space race where... <sighs> If we could get someone to walk on the moon, that was the greatest challenge we can accomplish. And I think the importance of Kennedy's speech, which its anniversary was last week, um, he gave that speech at Rice University and made it clear that we are a nation of basically creative people and we're going to take that creativity that will and that American drive to work hard and we're going to turn it into the greatest endeavor of humankind and then he was murdered assassinated and that adds an extra willpower to something so there was the we're going to do this because we're going to show the world how hard we work, how creative we are, and how well we can engineer things. And we're going to do it for this guy who was assassinated in his honor. And all of those emotions make it so easy sometimes in the grand scheme of hard <laughs> to accomplish masterful things. And I don't think we've had that combination of emotion and desire to prove who we are since then. The, the shuttle program with its completely new technology, its completely new way of do, doing things, the shuttle program in a lot of ways showed the world, hey, we're gonna not just fly rockets, we're gonna fly space planes. And the Soviets, they tried and one of the greatest sadnesses of the past decade is the warehouse where they were storing the buran the roof collapsed right on top of the spacecraft mm. it 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 breaks my heart that this spacecraft never made it into the museum it belonged in yeah no kidding and and now we're trying to prove without the emotional drive in a lot of ways that we can get back to the moon and it's become not a passion project because I really think the space race was a passion project. It has now become, 100 agree. yeah, it has now become, we have to complete this workbook that was assigned to us. Are you talking about the space shuttle or are you talking about just space flight now? I'm, I'm talking about like the SLS that is currently roving very slowly to escape a hurricane. <laughs> right. Um, I, I feel like are new you have to make it back to the moon by 2024 which we're not gonna do no um is really it has really taken on the emotional energy of i've been assigned a workbook to complete um yeah and that just creates a completely different energy around something but sputnik was uncrewed it was just a robotic spacecraft yeah and if there's one part of this industry that has grown dramatically it is robotic spacecraft i mean yes 
I am using Starlink right now to communicate yes. with you. <laughs> so I am depending on a robotic spacecraft to carry my my images and and audio to you. But there are weather satellites, uh, communication satellites, military satellites, navigation satellites, space telescopes. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of of these devices orbiting the planet, making our lives better. And, and what really gets me is that first Smut Sputnik was, like I said, it was something I could pick up and walk away being just 23 inches in diameter. And, and with that ability, and my hands are off screen, so it just like right off screen would be 23 inches. Um, it would be considered a CubeSat basically today. Mm -hmm. And it was transmitting in two frequencies. It did it for a couple of months. Drag caused it to fall back through the atmosphere. It was a CubeSat. And today, on similar CubeSats, we can pack so much more information. And, and to see us go from launching little tiny things to launching huge things capable of all sorts of things to, again, launching little tiny things, it's fun to see how in a lot of ways we've really gone full circle in the kinds of stuff we're putting into space. Yeah, yeah. There was a there was a a paper I was reading or an essay I was reading today and the guy made the point. He said that that if people want it and it doesn't break the laws of physics, yeah. then it's probably inevitable. Yeah. And and like being able to communicate to any other human being on earth from anywhere on earth is the kind of thing that we want. It doesn't break the laws of physics. Therefore right. it's probably inevitable. And we are seeing this as imagined in star Trek when they pull up, pop out their little communication device and communicate with each other. That's the, the path that we're moving to be able to know where we are, to, to communicate, to, to know the weather, to study the planet, to study the universe. And, and Sputnik started out on a 65 degree inclination orbit, which means that if, if, if you have our planet, its orbit was going from plus 65 north to plus 65 south every time it went around the planet in about 100 minutes. And because it was going around the planet in 100 minutes, each 65 degree orbit passed over a different part of our planet. And it was able to pass over pretty much every single human mm -hmm. in our world. So there was no one who didn't get to be part of this experience. And today we are filling that same kind of inclination orbit with Starlinks mm -hmm. so that everyone can have a chance to use it. And, and so to see the similarities between these projects is something that just... Yeah. And every astronomer... Life. No matter where they are, they can't run. They can have their <laughs> skies ruined by Starlink. Yes, this yeah. is true. I cannot yeah. deny this. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is the world that we that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Do, wh what do you think the re like the ripples as they continue on? Do you think that this this story will remain as important in terms of like space exploration legend? about so, Sputnik and the space race and the and the the feeling. I mean, it's before our time, so we don't yeah. know what it felt like, but I'm sure some people who are listening or watching have this visceral response of, of what it was like to know, to go from a time when we had, there were no artificial satellites to a time there were artificial yeah. satellites. And do you think that that legend will carry on into, into the future? I think the legend will hit in different ways for different people. One of the things that, that, made me feel like I had a role model. And role models really matter. Representation really matters. I, I have this extremely strong memory of in ninth grade being in the back seat of the car with my then boyfriend and we were both nerds and we were reading Timothy Ferris's Coming of Age in the Milky Way book. And we, he lived on Cape Cod. I lived in, nor in northern Massachusetts. We were driving him home. And um, we met at space camp. Um, oh, and, um, that is the ultimate nerd. Oh, my yeah, God. I, yeah, yeah. 
And, and we were both reading and we hit the part in the book Coming of Age in the Milky Way where it talked about the Harvard College women and the amazing work they did figuring out how to measure distances in space using our Lares, figuring out the, the spectra of stars relate to the temperatures of stars. All of these amazing things that were done by women who society otherwise cast out because they either had physical issues, hearing, or they were too smart to find a husband, which was a thing at the time. And when you're a nerd with the last name Gay, life is kind of hard in the 80s. And, <laughs> and sitting there reading about these women who overcame all the societal, yeah, we have no need for you issues, to make these amazing discoveries in the universe. That, that was life-changing for me. And I think that Homer Hickam's books that he's written, I think all of the, the books that have, have been written about the rocket history by so many different people are going to someday cause some other eighth grader probably sitting in an electric vehicle where you don't worry about the back seat because it's self-driving, so you're both in the front seat sharing reading the book and your parents don't have to be with you. That's a weird future. But we're headed there. Mm -hmm. I can imagine those kids reading the story of how Sputnik inspired an entire generation and seeing themselves represented in that coal miner's village and deciding I too can build rockets. And that's powerful. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, we've reached the end of our, of our episode. So happy birthday, Sputnik <laughs> 1. Congratulations to the, the giants standing on the shoulders of giants standing on the shoulders of giants that yes. got us to this modern space flight realm that we find ourselves in. Thanks, Pamela. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Fraser. And thank you to all of our patrons on patreon.com slash astronomycast. I know times are tough. I've, I've seen people having to give up their, their Patreon accounts, and I've reached out to a few basically to say, hey, are you okay? Because you've been around for years. Times are tough. And I'm so grateful to all of you who are still here. I would like to thank Gabriel Galfin, Dean, Sean Matz, John Drake, Roland Vormerdam, Sam Brooks and his mom, John Asseth, Corrine uh, Dimptruck, uh, Dahlia. Oh, no, they put a pronunciation guide in there. Thank you. Nice. Nula. I'd like to thank Nula. Bart Flaherty, Connor, the Air Major, Brian Kirby, New Zealand, Arctic Fox, Jordan Turner, Lee Harborn, Jason Cardukas, uh, Papa 1062, Robert Hudel, Kim Barron, Vitali, Paul Esposito, Arthur Latzhall, Frank Stewart, Ganesh Shremanthan, Bob Zatsky, Nate Detweiler, Ruben McCarthy, Ron Thorson, Time Lord Iro, Daniel Donson, Ian, Ian Abdelli, Abdella, and Jeff McDonald. If you too would like to be part of our Patreon community and have me potentially mispronounce your name in hopefully amusing ways, uh, go to patreon.com slash astronomycast. And your, your patronage allows us to pay the small fleet of people who are going to suffer through editing this episode that was interrupted by so many random dudes in my driveway causing me to be slightly creeped out. And the dogs. Thank you. And the dogs. And the dogs. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Uh, and then they saved. And then they saved. Um, that one. Oh. And I'm going to remember to save it in the correct folder this week. Oh. Uh, okay. Where did I save it? I can't tell you that. What? What's wrong? I saved it in Audacity. It, that's bad. Okay, let me just make sure that that's... Why would it do that? Well, obviously because it's a brand new machine and yeah, thought that was a good idea. But it wasn't a good idea.
Uh-huh. What? Oh, in documents. Okay, all right. Yeah, no, we won't be doing that. Okay. We save stuff onto the desktop. That's where we <laughs> save it. <laughs> I, I know that feel. <laughs> Yeah. And if my desktop has more than a couple of things on it, it means I have not relocated things to the shared drives. They need to Yeah, be it's at. exactly. It's time to clean. Yeah. When, that, when, you, when you reach that point. Uh, okay, good. All right. Now let me. Actually, I'm not going to kill that yet. Let me just upload and then we'll be safe. Yeah, I was, it was funny. I was, um, I was setting up the new computer. And I was just, I was so sick of it already. And I, I kept coming out to talk to Carla. And, and she's like, is your, you know, is the computer set up yet? I'm like, oh, I don't want to. Oh. And just like everything you got to log into and everything you got to reconfigure and everything you've got to, oh. So, so as a agony. Mac person, I do not have that problem. Although I yes, did. You do. Yes, you do. I have a Mac too. I Everything I, sh I save, I save to the cloud. So all, sure. I have to, so all I have to do is install the software, which isn't that painful because I use Google Docs, Sheets, et cetera, for 99% of what I do. If you want to FTP into your server, don't you have to generate a new private key and then register that new private key with the server that you're trying to log into? So I use I have to add my IP to the firewall because I use IP firewall instead of private Perfect. keys. Yeah, there's the thing you have to do. I and then <laughs> I, just, I just I just all of that stuff. I'm like, oh god! And then this is not working because I have to reconfigure my my editor environment in my um. Yeah, yeah. Citizen Gold is saying it, right? The joy of having to bend the new machine back into the shape of the old one. That's it's exactly true. it. It's true. Okay, that's yeah. fair. I did yeah. run into the most bizarre problem last week, and I still have to fix it. I, I got Tiny Intern a uh, mini iPad to work on for doing art for various projects. And it's linked to my account so that she can access all of the apps I, I've purchased. And... I did a sync between my account and the the Mac the iPad Mini, and it decided to name the iPad Mini the name of my iPad Pro. And when she goes off somewhere with with the iPad Mini, my watch starts telling me that Ophelia has left the vicinity of all my other devices, which which has panicked me multiple times because did someone steal my iPad Pro? And and no, I now have two devices called Ophelia and I need to fix this. Mm -hmm. See, there you go. Just a good example. And you're like, <laughs> I got to do a thing. Right, uh, right. We will get there though. There will be this day when you won't have to configure anything locally. It's all just going to be in the cloud. Yeah. And you'll just log into your machine. And now you just you'll need an RFID. Yeah, I mean, that'd be even easier that yeah. you'll have a little bracelet you wear, you'll sit down and you'll, it'll check your bracelet, it'll check your retina, and then away you go, or something. Something you are, something you have, something you know. Yes. Um, yes. So let's deal with some questions. So number okay. one, uh, Alan Gross asks, anything to say about the DART mission collision this evening? I think it's I... going to be delayed. From by because of a because of a space hurricane. Oh, okay, fine, fine. What are the chances of Dart actually happening tonight? Come on. So, so one. I don't know if you realize this, but today is Rosh Hashanah, and so there's a whole lot of people who are like, "Why is NASA ruining another holiday?" But it seems I've heard a rumor that I really love. It's it, I don't know if it's true. I need to find someone to find out if it's true because I really want it to be true. I have heard the rumor that the actual encounter was delayed some very small amount of time. So it occurred after sunset. And I really want that to be true. <laughs> um, so, so I'm super looking forward to this. It's the kind of thing 
where it can do no harm and there are so many amazing outcomes to consider. It is entirely possible that Didymus, Diddy Moon in my head forever, is is going to like Dimorphous. plunge. That's the main asteroid. The moon, no. the moon is Didymus. Didymus is, Didymus is the asteroid. Dimorphous is the moon. Dang it! I can never get this one right. Thank you, thank you. And you call it Diddy Moon because it's the moon of Didymus. You're right. I screwed it up. It's Dimorphous. I actually wrote a, an entire article on all of this and managed to spell uh, Didymus seven different ways. Nice. I, 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 yeah. I, I, much to my humiliation, I had someone on the mission team uh, read through it and, and they, they like corrected my spellings. And I'm going back and I'm like, oh my God. I just want to crawl under my desk with the dogs and hide there. Um, anyways, there, there is the potential, and I'm going to call it Diddy Moon so I don't screw up. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. the potential that Dart is going to plunge into Diddy Moon and just kind of live inside the rubble pile and have a fully inelastic collision. And if it's a fully inelastic collision, it's not going to change the orbit very much. Describe live. Define live in this in this scenario. You mean like plunge in at at six kilometers a second? Six kilometers a second and be fine? No, not be fine. It's going mm. to have its um, robotic remains encased in rocks, like right. diving into a ball pit and having the balls fill in behind right. you. So by live, you mean die? Yeah, it really doesn't have any other future. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but the point being that it will it will be absorbed into the asteroid and and we won't even see anything happen. And in the case of a fully inelastic collision, poor Lycia Cube is just going to sit there going, I lost my friend and nothing <laughs> exciting really happened. Now, the best possible case is a fully elastic collision that also causes a bunch of the mass of Diddy Moon to fly off because if you have the rock if you have dart go in hit the surface with all of its energy and bounce back off it transfers all of its momentum to the rock to Diddy Moon and then if a whole bunch of other stuff flies off with it as a result of the collision then conservation of momentum means what's left of Diddy Moon is going to go even faster forward so the most observable case is if Dart hits Diddy Moon, bounces off, and brings a whole lot of rocks expelling right. off with it. But the, but the only way for it to not change the orbit is if it just punches a hole right through. If it punches right. a hole right through and comes out the other side still going six kilometers a second, that is deeply mysterious because that means yes. no, no friction was involved. Right. But, um, then, if, but then the orbit wouldn't change in any other scenario. Yeah. The orbit changes yeah. so if it somehow punches its way all the way through and comes out the other side going like instead of six kilometers a second more like six kilometers a month um it will have transferred some energy to diddy moon and changed the orbit uh right. so so Lycia Cube is out there hanging out, watching what happens. Hera is going to get there in 2024 and watch it for four years. Um, we're going to punch an asteroid, and that's kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah, Unfortunately, exciting. they have terrible baud rates to get the data back, so they're going to get back like one image a day. But if 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 you're out there, tune in to... Uh, the the eyes on the skies deep space now network page and you can actually watch which antenna at any given moment they have tuned in to gather the signal and uh when i checked it right before we recorded it was watching dart and getting information back so dart is sending back images to home as yes. it's getting closer and closer to the asteroid yes. But then it will fling see a cube. I think it may. I I don't. It know. already has. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, but, but is the is the data rate how much? I think it's like one image a second is the data rate for to for send images dark. home for dark. 
until Dart dies. Yeah, so Lycia Cube is very cute, very adorable, with very low bandwidth. Yes. So yeah. so with Lycia Cube, we're looking much more at one image yeah. a day. So Dart But, but all is that amazing. matters really is one image. There's one picture we really need to see. I think there's probably going to be more like 20 that will make a really cool animated GIF. 20 mm. days from now, come Halloween, we'll have a really good story to tell. Yeah. All right. Hal McKinney asks, surprised I'm not hearing more discussion about the potential good, I think, consequences of satellite-capable smartphones potentially bypassing Russia, Chinese, et cetera, internet censorship. There's a lot to unpack mm -hmm. there. So, yeah. so um, a company called Link has demonstrated that you can communicate with a satellite with a CubeSat to smartphones. They yes. they built this smartphone, this CubeSat. They flew overhead and were randomly connecting to people's smartphones as they were going. They were essentially a Wi-Fi hotspot that smartphones were attempting to communicate with and they were able to log all of the attempts. And essentially people had smartphones that are just like like if free Wi-Fi comes by, connect to it. You know, that free yeah, airport yeah, Wi-Fi yeah, yeah. that's actually a scam designed to steal all your all yeah, your information. Yeah. So they pretended to be one of those. And they were and they found it worked surprisingly well. And we now know that that SpaceX and T Mobile are going to be launching a you can send text messages from anywhere where there isn't cell phone coverage. Uh, the Apple iPhone 14, which I'm sure you've already bought. Um, no, oh, no, I am. Okay, I, all right. I, I, I am we'll waiting. We'll send an emergency message yeah. to to satellites. So, so we are now entering the era. Now, the the with the Starlink, they need that next generation, the bigger ones that are going to be able to actually allow you to send messages. But eventually, back to what I mentioned earlier in the episode, if it's a thing we want and it doesn't violate the laws of physics, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so you will get to a point where you take out your smartphone and you connect to a satellite overhead and you begin communicating. So back to Hal's original point, will it allow you to bypass satellite sponsor, uh, censorship? And yes. Did you see what yes. happened over the yes weekend? Yes and no. So, so I, think, I think it was Secretary of State Blinken. It may have been somebody else. My memory is fuzzy. Um, tweeted out how... Uh, we are going to work to maintain free and uncensored communications. And uh, I believe it was with all nations, like all the Russian federal bloc mm. things. Because um, crazy shit is happening. Uh, happening. Mm. I don't know. I'm not going to go into it. People don't need their days around. Um, yeah. But right under it was Elon Musk saying, turning on Starlink in those regions now. Yeah. And that was like back in the war, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is um, this is more places than just you, just Ukraine. Right, right, right. Um, so, so the, so let's say like like Starlink wants to sell terminals in China. Yeah. China will say no. fine, but you have to, but you have, yeah, no, or you have to, you have, they have to fall under the Great Firewall. Yeah, and he won't and, do that. Well, maybe, maybe he will, who knows? But the point being that, so then you're not allowed to buy a Starlink terminal, but you can smuggle a Starlink terminal into China and yes. it will work, it'll yes. function. Now, right now it won't work because it's geofenced. Yeah. But if 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 Starlink says, you know what, we're gonna um, un-geofence this thing, it can work anywhere on planet Earth. If you can yeah. get a signal, then you're communicating. Yeah. Now. The Starlink terminals give off a very obvious signal. And so if you were in China, you could just take your, your signal detector and go, is anyone using a Starlink terminal around these parts? Yeah, Drive, yeah. knock on the door, arrest the people inside the house. But if you had a Starlink terminal on a car and you're driving really quickly, well, then maybe you could get away with it for a while. Yeah. Um, and you could imagine as well China saying, okay, if you fly one of these satellites over our country and you don't turn off the signal on the starlinks you're a bad person and we're not going to yeah. let you do business in china and now they you know it's all starlink isn't allowed to do business in china anyway but you can imagine them saying well you know what you can't sell teslas in china anymore yeah so there are ways to pressure elon musk which could in theory pressures spacex but 
But yeah, you can absolutely imagine a time when everybody has their smartphone and they can receive messages from space directly to their smartphone. No, no special hardware software necessary that keeps them appraised about what's happening in the world. Yeah. So I don't know if you follow Naomi Wu. She goes by Sexy Cyborg on Twitter and YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. She she's an amazing maker and gets into really fascinating discussions on her Twitter because she is testing the limits of what you can do as a Chinese citizen in a lot of what she does. And she's openly discussing a lot of these problems. And um, yeah, give her a follow and go back through her history if you want to see more about exactly how China is dealing with a lot of these things. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's it's a, it really is an arms race because yeah. for the Chinese, all this new technology is you know, especially like what's happening with COVID, like they, they have an app on everybody's phone in the entire country that, yeah. that tells people where they can and can't go, what they can and can't do, what, what things they, ha who they can't see, can see, like you can imagine how you could get pretty comfortable with that level of control and power over your entire populace to use yeah. them for things that weren't ostensibly trying to protect them from COVID. So it's a, it's a, it's a funny time, but yeah. But I think that there are plenty of countermeasures to stop a person from from communicating with the wider world via internet. And there's already ways. Yeah. I mean, you just get a VPN and you're in China, you yeah. can be I've browsing YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that, that technology already existed and you have to be very motivated and willing to accept the consequences because they can be serious yeah. for people in those countries to be using technologies that they shouldn't be using to learn about things. Like I have a friend in China who I talk to every couple of days, helping me practice my Chinese, helping her practice her English. That's awesome. And she just, just doesn't care. Right? You're just like, hey, do you want to talk about, you know, there are lots of topics I can talk about. And I, and I don't even really bring them up because she doesn't care. Like, like these are not, that entire populace has been uh, raised yeah. to have a certain perspective about the way the world works and that's they're true. not People super in... curious about other things they yeah. don't have access so it's not easy they know there are consequences if they try they just don't do care. work they don't care yeah and yeah. and i think that's true of people in every single nation um you and i are in that small percentage of humans who've had the opportunities to travel the world and and I sometimes talk to my friends from college in Michigan who basically never leave Michigan. They've been mm -hmm. to Canada. They've been to Ohio. Um, <laughs> but yeah. their, their worldview is, is what you experience in Michigan. And, and so there's entire segments of culture and understanding other places that they just don't have the the empathy for due to a lack of experience. Mm -hmm. And yep. if you don't let your people travel to other countries, you can train them to believe anything. And when I was in the Soviet Union, uh, right before the fall in 91, the things that people thought were so limited simply because they didn't have any reference points for anything else. Yeah. Yep. All right. We've reached the end of our hour. Uh, thank you, everyone, for thank hanging you. out with us today. And uh, don't forget to watch Dart tonight. Yes. This is it. Watch Dart. This is going to be exciting. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks to ever, all of the uh, moderators. Thanks to everyone watching us on YouTube and on Twitch, if that ever worked. And if it didn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> it did people not on work Twitch. This time. Thanks, Pamela, for bringing the brain. <laughs> Thanks to uh, everyone behind the scenes. And we will see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. And I need to actually click the button to take us off because I'm producing, not Allie. Yep.